next speaker is well known to everybody, <clears throat> Dr. Teresa McLeod, uh, and she is going to review for us today uh, the Fleissner Society glossary. Um, she has a recording. Uh, she asked if she could use the recording since it's all timed perfectly, and I don't know anyone who says no to Dr. McLeod. So uh, uh, with that, I'll give you okay, this. Thank you very much. Just a few comments. I think we've had some excellent lectures on terminology. Uh, I think what we haven't addressed is really how accurate our terminology has been for describing disease processes and observations. So the Fleischner Society about 20 years ago decided to tackle this issue and uh, it's been updated over a period of time. So what I've done is to show you some examples. I've even put some questions in there that are more diagnostic questions, but I think will um, help you to understand how important our terminology is to both our patients and our clinicians. Okay, we can go ahead. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dr. Teresa McLeod, I'm a thoracic radiologist at Massachusetts General Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And my topic is on the Fleischner Glossary of Terms. Uh, I am a member of the Fleischner Society and these terms were developed over a period of about 15 years and are ongoing. There are some new revisions that I would encourage you to read the most uh, current that is available. Now, why did the Fleischner Society want to create a glossary of terms? Well, I think you know, probably having recently been through your, your internship and entering radiology, that we use a lot of descriptive terms and sometimes we don't understand them. And there are times certainly, perhaps more frequently, that our attending physicians don't understand them or they have misconceptions about them. So the Fleischner Society itself would be very helpful to explain all these terms in detail. Uh, Felix Fleischner, by the way, was a pioneer radiologist. He was a tremendously admired man who escaped the Nazis and came to the United States and uh, made some, some of the very seminal contributions to thoracic radiology. So I'm going to show only a few cases and a few examples because there are a large number in the actual glossary. And what I'll plan to do is to show you some signs. And I may have some multiple choice questions and you can just answer those uh, privately. Um, there won't be any response to them. Uh, and uh, I'll describe each of the signs. And you'll see that the definitions are quite rigorous and they're very detailed, but I'll try to give you an overall impression of, in a couple of words that I think will help you to understand each of the uh, particular signs in the glossary. So the air crescent sign, you can see it on a chest X-ray or CT. It's a collection of air in a crescentic shape, which separates the wall of a cavity from an inner mass. And here we see uh, a cavity can see the wall, and then we see this mass within it that separates uh, the, it contains gas and separate, uh, the gas separates it uh, from the remainder of the lining of the cavity. Now here is the first multiple choice question. What is the most common cause of an air crescent sign? A cavitating lung cancer? Pulmonary infarct? Tuberculosis? or aspergillus infection. And I'll give you just four or five seconds, maybe 10 seconds, just to pick what you think is the most likely correct answer. And it's aspergillus infection. That's certainly the most common cause of this sign. Now, aspergillus can be benign or just inflammatory. It's an, a fungus ball inside a pre-existing cavity. It may be a bore, it could be an old tuberculous cavity. But the more malignant, and I don't mean in the terms of cancer, but in terms of how it affects the patient is what is called angioinvasive aspergillosis. And we see this usually in immunocompromised patients, particularly those that are neutropenic. So the definition here given by the Fleischmann Society is a collection of air in a crescentic shape, in a crescentic shape which separates the wall of the cavity from an inner mass, and we've already mentioned that. 
But the air crescent sign is often considered characteristic of either aspergillus colonization of a pre-existing cavity, which I mentioned, and that's called a fungus ball. And sometimes these fungus balls can move around. And if you turn the patient from supine uh, to lying on their back, uh, you'll find that uh, lying on their back to uh, moving to the front, you, you'll actually see the fungus ball move. So prone to supine. Or of retraction of infarcted lung and angioinvasive aspergillosis, where there is a true infarction that occurs. Okay, let's move on to the next item. Uh, very common again, ground glass opacity. We use it all the times, but sometimes it's somewhat misunderstood. Now, I think there's a little bit of a, a um, no, I wouldn't say a conflict, but maybe some um, questions whether everyone feels that the chest radiograph is very good at diagnosing ground glass opacity. And I personally don't use it for findings on a standard chest radiograph. That's because it's an area of hazy increased lung opacity, which is usually extensive and within which pulmonary vessels are indistinct. And you'll find in patients who may have a perfectly normal chest X-ray, but they're obese, or alternatively, they haven't taken a very deep breath. And we'll see this haziness, the ground glass opacity, mainly at the basis of the lungs, and it may only be due to the lung volume. So I reserve the use of ground glass opacity just to CT scanning. It's a hazy increased opacity of the lung with preservation of bronchial and vascular margins. That's the most important part. It's caused by partial filling of air spaces, by interstitial thickening, by fluid cells and or fibrosis, partial collapse of alveoli, increased capillary blood volume, or a combination of these, the common factor being the partial displacement of air. It's less opaque than consolidation in which bronchovascular margins are obscured. So that's a lot of verbiage. And I will say as a member of the Fleischner Society, we want to be so exact about everything that I think we came up with too many words. But the important thing to see a ground glass opacity, it's hazy and you can see the pulmonary blood vessels through, you can see the pulmonary arteries. And here's an example, and that's really all you need to know. I think you can see this is hazy opacity. Uh, you can also see so the bronchi going through it, but more importantly, you're able to see these branching vessels. You won't see that in consolidation. You won't see that in a mass. So that's the important definition of ground glass opacity. <clears throat> it is amorphous looking and it usually has fully defined borders. Now, this is a relatively large area of the lung that's involved, but you can also have ground glass nodules, uh, which have a typical spherical shape, but often their margins are not very well defined. So a question, which of the following is not associated with ground glass opacity? Pulmonary hemorrhage, pulmonary edema, pneumocystis pneumonia, Staphylococcal pneumonia or pulmonary alveolar prognosis. Remember, it's which one is not associated with ground glass opacity. Now, I'll give you a few seconds to pick out your favorite choice. And a staphylococcal pneumonia. All the others are characterized by ground glass opacification. And I'll just go back to emphasize this. Uh, there are important observations. One is a pulmonary hemorrhage. Uh, if you see as an area of ground glass capacity, if the patient has hemoptysis, for example, is probably hemorrhage. Pulmonary edema, of course, is the most common. And there are certain pneumonias, classic as pneumocystin pneumonia. And then you can have other diffuse diseases such as pulmonary alveolar prognosis. So those are the some of the classic examples of ground glass opacity. Now let's move on to honeycombing. And this is a very important observation in thoracic radiology because it really defines what we call an end-stage lung or a fibrotic lung. And the pathologists have known about honeycombing for a long time and have come up with very precise definition of honeycombing. It's destroyed in fibrotic lung tissue containing numerous air spaces with thick fibrous walls, representing the late stage of various lung diseases with complete loss of acinar architecture. 
And here is a pathologic exa example. You can see these honeycombs as they vary in size, they're fairly thick walled, and here surrounded by areas of very dense fibrosis. Now the CT findings are very characteristic, um, but very precise at the same time. And as you read this, I think the definition is very important not to confuse um, honeycombing with other uh, processes, particularly in patients with pulmonary fibrosis, they'll have a lot of linear opacities at the bases and it's easy to um, suspect at least that some of them are rounded and they represent cystic air spaces, but it's very important that we be accurate. And why is that the case? Because often if the honeycombing is characteristic and identified, uh, the patient won't require a biopsy to make the diagnosis of fibrosis. So that's why it's important that we be very rigid about our definition and make sure the uh, different characteristics are appreciated. So here is the definition. Cluster, clustered cystic air spaces typically of comparable diameters of the order of three to 10 millimeters. Now, usually it's around five millimeters, three to five. Once it gets about five, it's a little bit unusual, but you can see large honeycomb cysts as large as 2.5 centimeters. It's usually subplural, that's very characteristic and characterized by well-defined thick walls, which are often well-defined walls, excuse me, which are often thick. Here are a couple of examples. Uh, here is a patient who has honeycombing. Notice that there's more than one level of honeycombing. There are about three to four honeycomb spaces that are stacked together in this particular example, and you must have more than one. Um, the, note that the findings are mostly in the upper lobe on this patient, which is a little bit unusual. We usually see honeycombing at the bases. Here is an example of honeycombing that is very se severe, more located at the mid to lower aspect of the lung. Notice that there are skip areas. There are areas that are almost normal in between the areas that are very severely affected. And notice that there are uh, thick walled cysts and they vary a lot in size in this particular patient, particularly in the right lower lobe. And you can see that some of them are indeed quite, uh, quite notable for their size. Usually the characteristic size is more of what you would see here in the lingular and they're relatively small in diameter. So this is end stage lung. This is very fibrotic lung. So a question now, which of the following is most commonly associated with honeycomb? Sarcoidosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is also the pathologic term is usual interstitial pneumonia, nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, scleroderma, or hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And I'll give you a few seconds here. And the answer is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, or UIP. That's by far the most common cause. Okay, let's move over. Oh, let's move on rather to a final example, a tree and bud pattern. Uh, this is seen on CT only. And central lobular branching structures that resemble a budding tree. So it reflects a spectrum of endo and peribronchial disorders, including mucoid impaction, inflammation, and or fibrosis. So remember the bronchioles are very small, usually two millimeters or less in diameter. Uh, so we're talking about very small peripheral airways that are, create this pattern. This pattern is most pronounced in the lung periphery where the small airways are, and is associated with the abnormalities of the small airways. And here is an example, um, and I'll show you one with perhaps uh, uh, a larger number of the tree and bud opacities, but you can see them well. You can see these are uh, impacted bronchioles, probably contain uh, mucus, they no longer contain air, and they're branching, uh, they're budding and they're branching. And notice that they don't extend right to the pleural surface, there's usually a couple of millimeters uh, distance between the tree and bud opacity. So these are infected uh, are, um, bronchi that are filled with secretions that create this pattern. And here is just a nice, true uh, nature built uh, tree and bud opacities. Well, 
So here is a diagram of bronchiola disease. Uh, the bronchioles accompanying the pulmonary arteries and so the secondary pulmonary lobule, which uh, I'm sure you're aware of is what we use as the basic anatomic um, uh, anatomic area that we refer to in most of our in most of our dictations and our evaluation of lung pathology. And you can see the bronchioles entering the center of the secondary pulmonary lobule. And when there are tree and bud opacities, there are uh, usually infectious material and secretions which fill the peripheral airways. And you can see at the very tip form these really bulbous portions of mucus and secretions. And here I think you have some very nice examples from David Nadich. You can see multiple of these stream bud opacities really scattered throughout almost the entire right upper and the middle lobe was affected as well. So trium bud opacities characteristically due to the presence of infected mucoid secretions. I say pointed out with the arrows. This leads to impacted peripheral airways with a central lobular distribution. And there really is an extensive differential diagnosis, but some of the common offenders are just standard pneumonia but also tuberculosis, particularly in the early stages, you'll see, tend to see tree and bud opacities before consolidation and cavitation develops. Mycobacterium avium intracellulare infection as well, as commonly manifest with this finding. Aspiration, and that's probably the most common entity that we see day to day. Uh, People who aspirate may not even be aware of it, but you'll usually see that at the bases, not surprisingly. Allergic bronchopulmonary spergillosis, and of course in cystic fibrosis, uh, the major airways are involved, but you'll see a lot of involvement as well of the peripheral airways and bronchioles with evidence of, of tree and bud opacities. Oh, there are some rare. Aspiration is not rare. I put that in capitals so at the end to show you that there's probably one of the most frequent um, causes of tree and bud opacity. Okay, that's the end of my talk. I hope you've enjoyed it, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Just a couple of things that I want to emphasize. I did show examples. I didn't want to give you a whole list of all the definitions, but I want to emphasize also that the each of the terms that we use as descriptors and examples, uh, the, the Fleischner glossary also provides you with a pathologic definition. So you can compare the pathology with the radiologic definition. Hopefully this is used for many terms and will make our descriptors um, much more accurate than they may be in, in common use. Thank you for your attention.